investigating uh, the React Solar System. I believe it said ecosystem in the meetup, but everything kind of revolves around React, so it's a solar system. That's kind of how I'm thinking about it. But the idea behind this is that um, when you're when you're about to learn React, or when you hear about React, if you don't know about it, you, you hear that you have to learn about React. You also have to learn about Redux. You also have to learn about GraphQL. You have to learn about CSS and JS. There's like all these things that get thrown at you at once that you have to know about. And um, I don't believe that's necessarily the case. I feel like you could just learn React or um, just learn um, JavaScript and different parts of it. So what I want to do is kind of take some time to go through the different parts um, of this solar system, as I'm calling it, so you can kind of get an idea of my suggestion on if you're learning React or learning other parts in the React ecosystem the order in which you should um, learn them. So that's kind of the motivation. I have the slides already up on my Twitter account, so if you go to uh, BinNVP on Twitter, I've already tweeted out a link to the slides. Um, I have a very tiny URL at the bottom. You can actually read that. That's also a URL to the slides, so you can check those out because I'll have lots of links to resources and references and things like that, so you may want to check that out. Um, so, uh, the first thing I like to do when I um, start off is to have everyone stand up. Can I get everyone to stand up? We've been sitting down for a while, we've been working all day, most of us, so let's stand up. And, and what we're going to do, for those who can't see in the back, is we're going to do 10 squats, okay? <laughs> 10 squats all together in unison, and I'll, I'll count it out for us. So we'll put our hands out front and then do squats like that, okay? So let's do 10 of them together. Say it out nice and loud. We'll have lots of fun with this, okay? Here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Great job. Four, five, six. Oh, it's burning, huh? Seven, eight, almost there. Nine, and 10. Great job. Before you sit down, turn to people next to you. Introduce yourself. Just say hello real quick. All right, now you can go ahead and have a seat. Okay, everyone was, was well welcomed, I assume. So, um, now that you guys have all met each other, just a little bit about me. Like she said, my name is Ben Alegbadu. I'm a Christian, a husband, and a father. This is a picture of my uh, wife, Rashida. We've been married almost seven years now, and our two daughters, Simone and Avery. Uh, Simone is the older one. Avery is the younger one, giving her the side eye for some reason in this picture. <laughs> but they definitely uh, love each other. Um, <laughs> I promise. Uh, we live in Pittsburgh, California, so that's like what I call the Far East Bay. If you're familiar with the, the BART line, it's the end, the Pittsburgh Bay Point line. So not Pittsburgh, California, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's Pittsburgh, California. And I work at Eventbrite. Um, like Tracy said, I'm an engineering manager on our destination team. If you're unfamiliar with Eventbrite, we're a ticketing platform. Uh, but typically, you go to Eventbrite because someone told you to buy a ticket to a conference. But what we want is for you to come to Eventbrite to find things to do on the weekend or find events to go to. So that's what my team is kind of ch uh, chartered with figuring out at Eventbrite. And then lastly, I'm a huge uh, basketball fan. Uh, grew up in Houston, so I'm a Rockets fan. Very sad that we lost in the previous uh, series, but, but that's okay. Love playing basketball, love watching basketball. Um, and I'm actually sad that I'm missing the Cavs game right now, speaking to you, but that's okay. <laughs> you guys are more important, I promise. So let's talk about this Re React uh, solar system here. Uh, this, is, this is the agenda, we're gonna talk about React, JavaScript, tooling, styling, uh, and so forth. Uh, bad news though is that this talk is actually 45 minutes long, and Tracy said I only have 20 minutes. So we're only gonna do the first half of it, and I'll kind of give a sneak preview of what the rest of it is, but you have the slides, you can check out um, the rest. Um, if you would like to. So let's talk about React, which is the sun, because React is on fire, right? <laughs> that was a bad one. Um, anyway, <laughs> React, for those who don't know, uh, uh, 
is very different in, in the development pattern than an MPC, traditional MPC um, way. So it's functional and reactive, meaning you set your state and then things update as a result of it, uh, which also means that it's unidirectional. We already looked at some JSX before, and that's like the new syntax for how you write your markup and the virtual DOM, um, which we talked about earlier as well, which helps um, with updates so that you don't have to manually update yourself. And then what I like about React especially is that it has a very narrow API, like I can keep it all in my head. I'm rarely actually going to the documentation for React as I'm building apps because there's only so many things you have to know about. Um, and, and these slides, all of those are links to documentation on the React uh, website if you want to learn more about those pieces of it. But let's take a quick example of what I mean by the differences between um, React and kind of traditional development. So here's a simple UI. Right, it's a button. I click the button, it increments the number in the text field. And if we were doing this in jQuery, it's pretty straightforward. We just kind of do what we would expect. You wire a click handler on that button, and when somebody clicks, it gets that text field, grabs the value from that text field there, and then finally updates the value. So it, it, it's heavily reliant on the DOM. It's actually storing the current state in the DOM inside that text field. And this is uh, the way that we've done development for many, for very long using jQuery. And for something really simple, this is actually uh, a really easy um, approach to doing things. But if we were to transition into what it looks like in React, it's more declarative. You kind of state, you declare your state and then um, declare what you want the UI to do as a result of it or as a function of that state. So now we have our value, we initialize it to zero because that's our state, and then we render out the UI here. So we render out that input field like before and put the value there inside the value and then on the click handler, we're gonna do something. We're gonna call that handle click and then set state. And then as a result of setting that state, you know, if you're familiar with React, the kind of unidirectional loop happens again uh, the UI updates and it tells it to re-render, and as a result, it's going to re-render a, um, a new value inside that input field. And by the way, using the functional or the updater version of set state, because I'm depending on the previous state, so um, by using the previous, by passing in the function, it'll get called right when the UI is actually going to be uh, the set state actually gets called, because normally set state is asynchronous. So it could be if I use a normal object set state and I click the button really fast, it may only actually update once as opposed to the five times that I clicked it. So that's a little interesting tidbit about React. Um, so if you're interested in learning about React, I highly suggest reading the tutorial if you're unfamiliar uh, with React. Uh, the tutorial goes through all the different pieces of React, all the kind of best practices. From going just through the tutorial, you'll know everything you need to know to be able to build um, applications. So, um, when if you don't know React and you want to get into that kind of ecosystem, just take time to just learn React, like just React itself. Don't try to add in any additional libraries. Just uh, get used to how to build it, how to do everything reactive in that sense, and get really solid with that. And then you can move on to the next things. So, if you're uh, interested, I did a talk at 4JS, it's called React Exposed, I kind of went into some little details about uh, how React works and why, the, the way it works underneath the hood, kind of how that affects some of the oddities you might have to do um, in React, so you can check that out if you're, if you're interested. Um, so after React, and kind of really almost in tandem with React is JavaScript, because you're actually writing React in JavaScript. When I'm talking about JavaScript, I'm really talking about ES Next or ES6 Plus, ES6 and beyond. So all the kind of new JavaScript that, we, um, that we're getting. So talking about modules, talking about classes, the spread operator, which is super helpful for maintaining immutability. You never want to mutate an object. You never want to mutate an array. You always want to clone it and then add stuff to it. And the spread operator makes that super easy. Uh, destructuring, block scoping, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many different features uh, with ES6 and then um, with async functions that came out with um, 2017 or coming out this year. Uh, lots of uh, cool functionality there, and I totally don't have um, time to talk about that, 
Um, I highly suggest if you're unfamiliar with ES6 to just ramp up on that as well. Like that skill set will even help you outside of React, just being able to have that solid foundation there. And uh, I guess another shameless plug for myself um, is that I gave a talk at React Conference just about React and ES6 and putting those, ES Next and putting those two, two together. Because the great thing about React is that outside of, the J, of JSX, React is basically just JavaScript. You're writing JavaScript. So being really solid at JavaScript will help you really be really solid at writing React. I'm um, going to have some links here. Uh, the first link is uh, a blog post, I, or a blog series I did on ES6. So mm -hmm. all of those different topics, I wrote um, specific blog posts on each one of those. And at Eventbrite, we have a coding <laughs> style guide for ES6 as well. So if you're looking for best practices on how to write ES6, because you can do lots of interesting and funky things, um, you can check that out as well. OK, so now let's move. Talked about React. In JavaScript, let's move into where it starts getting interesting, kind of setting up your app. And there are a lot of different um, tools you can use in this area. The first one, uh, which I hope everybody has if you're developing in React, is getting the React Dev Tools. So it's available in Chrome and Firefox, I believe, just Chrome and Firefox still, but super helpful in debugging your React apps. Um, It'll actually now tell you, at least in the Chrome version, if you're on a page that has React, and it'll like light up, and then you can expect the whole entire um, DOM tree. So here, I can see what state is going on in my React application on that uh, DOM node. I can look at event handlers, look at props. Like You can just really dive in and expect what's going on in your app without having to even fire up the debugger. So that's super helpful with, um, with React development. But then moving on. So now you're building an app, you have to figure out um, where you're going to get all your dependencies from. And there are a number of uh, package managers that you can use. So there's NPM, there's Bower, and there's, and there's Yarn. There was Bower, but Bower <laughs> like, no longer exists, right? No one ever uses it anymore. It's basically just NPM and Yarn. And uh, Yarn is, I guess, newish. It's been around for, since last October, so that's like nine months or so. Um, and that's kind of, I guess, the new player, although now NPM is coming out with version 5 to kind of do a lot of the similar things that Yarn is doing. But what Yarn offers, if you're unfamiliar with Yarn, is um, flat mode, which is similar to what came out in NPM 3, um, so that you don't have nested dependencies. They're all deduped at the top, if possible. Uh, that, that can help your uh, module size go from something that's really huge to something that's really small. Um, it caches all of the packages that it um, installs. So you could, in theory, install a whole, your whole repo, um, go on an airplane, turn off Wi-Fi, and be able to reinstall without having any internet. And the best part of it is the lock file, which helps uh, things be deterministic so that what happens on your machine is the same thing that happens on your CI server and wherever else is getting installed. So we have that, we have the package managers, we've got the bundlers. And we have lots of different bundlers in, the, uh, in this space, although Webpack is like far and away the number one uh, bundling system that people use with Webpack 2. Um, I'm sad to say that at Eventbrite, we're still using Require.js. <laughs> that's why I'm saying no, because that's like personal experience. <laughs> We're moving away from it to Webpack 2, so I'll say that. But uh, Require.js was just never imagined to, to work with kind of the modern system of, uh, of JavaScript that we're using now. So um, yeah, just don't use Require.js. I would just suggest pushing you to the, to the left to go to, to Webpack. Um, but Webpack and uh, Rollup and a number of other ones have this feature that I really like called tree shaking which helps your bundle, bundles get a lot smaller. So if you're not familiar with tree shaking, it works with ES6 modules. So here in this example, we have this um, math.js file, and it has two functions in it, square and cube. So square takes the square of a value that's passed in, cube takes the cube of the value um, that's, that's passed into it. And then we have this main.js uh, example down here. And all we're doing is importing cube. So instead of doing import math for math.js and doing math.cube, 
we're directly um, importing the named function Q that was exported here. And then we're just console logging it, and the cube of five is in fact 125. But as a result of, since we never actually used the square function in here, and we imported it this way, the resultant bundle will only include Q as well as the code that I wrote in my main.js. So as if you can just imagine you using um, lots of different libraries, your own code that's importing different things, you can actually get a huge uh, benefit. It's much smaller bundle size by using and leveraging tree shaking. So the only thing is that um, the library that you're using for your code, bless you, um, has to ex use modules as its export. So it has to export modules. So what you may end up doing with libraries, especially, is you transpile everything in your code except for the modules. You leave those as ES6 modules so that you can then import it and leverage tree shaking that way. So that's in Webpack 2 and um, Rollup. So then there are task runners, and this is a, a big uh, space. Uh, grunt is the one that's been there for the, for the longest. So you have lots of grunt files and lots of configurations. Basically, not only do you want to minify or an uglify, uglify and prettyfy for some reason. Um, we do both now. Um, and you want to bundle. You're just like all these different tasks that you want to do. You need something to help you do it. So that's where grunt came in. And then gulp tried to come in with like a streamed functional approach, which was a lot better than the messy grunt files we ended up having. And then there was like a revolt basically against both of those. And it's like, why don't we just do everything in NPM scripts? Basically, all we're doing is just calling command line things. So just put scripts in our uh, package.json, and that might make life easier. So here are some examples of that. Um, I, I'm calling this yarn run val validate um, script here uh, to validate before I push uh, to master or, or what have you. And what that does, that ends up running my linting as well as running my tests. And then I have another script that's the lint that's running my SAS lint as well as my ES lint. And then I have ones for ES lint and one for SAS. So this is kind of just allowing you to uh, easily kind of put your scripts there. So they're all like command lines, but still uh, kind of call node modules that you have. So it's pretty straightforward if that's all you want to do. But if you're trying to do something more sophisticated, uh, then you're going to still have to use Gulp or use Grunt. But more than likely, you're going to key things off from here in your package.json file. Then there's static analyzers. We've got ESLint, we have Flow, and we have TypeScript. So ESLint was here first, I believe, and that was mainly around making sure that your code uh, was styled correctly. That's what ESLint was really about and what's what it started from, kind of moving on from JS Hint and those kind of uh, um, utilities. But then now ESLint can actually catch um, errors in your code as well and um, things like that. But Flow and TypeScript are more around um, type safety. So they let you annotate your code. Say you can tell this variable is uh, going to be a Boolean or this variable is going to be a number so that it can catch different things. Um, and TypeScript, so Flow is really just about typing, and TypeScript is type plus new features uh, of JavaScript. So classes existed in TypeScript before they existed in ES6, and TypeScript has interfaces, which actually don't exist in ES or in, in ECMAScript just yet, if at all. But um, that's TypeScript. So a lot of people use, I know people who use TypeScript with React, but most people end up using Flow with React because they both came out of Facebook. So one example of using Flow, this is super uh, easy and straightforward, is you install Flow and you have that set up and you just add a Flow um, annotation at the top, just add that comment, and it'll automatically start uh, check flow, uh, type checking your code. So without having any annotations, I have this function called foo, foo that's gonna multiply something by 10 so it infers that x needs to be a number, but I'm passing in hello world, and it complains that, hey, x is a string, but that's un incompatible with number, because that's what you can multiply by 10. So uh, using flow in that way uh, is pretty straightforward. I've actually had an app 
added, added flow into it after it and found a whole bunch of uh, uh, errors, and type errors that I had with it. Um, I think that flow, though, still has some work to do in terms of developer experience and making it a little easier to use, but um, it definitely does catch a lot of, a lot of issues. So that's the recap. Talked about all those five things. These are kind of my picks for what we, you should use for those. Um, but it's a lot to kind of take in and try to understand, especially if you're just trying to learn React. And you're just, like, how can you decide which ones of those to pick if you don't even know what all of them are and what they do? So the kind folks at uh, Facebook and the React team decided to come up with Create React app to make our lives easier. So no longer do we have to worry about copying some starter kit or understanding Webpack versus all these other things. You just install uh, Create React app globally and then run Create app. In this case, I'm calling mine Awesome App because all my apps are awesome. Um, but, uh, and then you just run it and then it pops up and all you have to do is just update uh, an app.js file and start putting your components there. So it ends up being uh, really easy and it comes with Webpack 2 now, ESLint, it's uh, a progressive web app by default, which we learned in the, the JavaScript Jeopardy um, and things like that. And here's some other links if you're interested about the tooling. So uh, continuing on. So now you, you can create your app. Um, it's, it's running. You can create components, but you actually need to make it look like something decent, right? So we have to talk about styling. So there are a number of different ways that you can achieve styling in uh, React. The easiest one, especially if you're transitioning from something before React to React, is to go the global CSS route. So there's something outside in the world that um, adds CSS to the page, puts classes in the page, um, bundles your CSS, and then you're just going to use those classes in your React components. Um, so here I'm using the ca a card component, and I have card uh, class names and other BIM style syntax um, inside of here. And the global CSS that would have done this would have been some global bundle that got, got, got created, lots of styles before, here are the couple of things for my card, and then lots of styles afterwards. So this is the easiest one, um, especially if you're transitioning, because more than likely you have a, a system that currently doesn't handle styling in your JavaScript framework. But then you can do things a little bit more componentized and do what I call component CSS, which is where you import a specific CSS file per component. So it works a lot like global CSS, except that you have a one-to-one -one mapping between your components and your um, CSS. And more, more than likely, if you were doing proper CSS before, you probably had individual component CSS files, but now you just actually import it in the React uh, um, component. So the classes look the exact same. Nothing is different here, except that you're now you're just importing the CSS file. And you'll need something like Webpack um, to do this, but uh, create React app do that for you. And then in a the snippet, you just um, have just the styling that you need for your code. And then later, when you're creating your bundles, all that will get sucked up and put into your bundle and st stuck into the, to the style, the style tag. So that's nice, and this is actually the, what we're using currently at Eventbrite, um, because it was the, kind of the simplest one to get started with. Then there's something called CSS modules, which takes it one step further, um, I believe. So you're still writing CSS, you still have CSS files, but you no longer have to worry about um, naming your CSS classes properly. So before this example, I still had to make sure that I had like this uh, BIM, what's BIM style, kind of a way to make sure that I don't have namespace collisions in my CSS. So I have to properly name all my classes. So typically, you would have the name of the component at the beginning of the class name. But with CSS modules now, um, you have your class name like this. You will import your CSS file, but instead of just importing it directly, you would now have this CSS object. And that will now give you class names that you can use. So CSS.root, CSS.title, CSS.image, like that. And that will be an auto-generated name. So you would write your CSS like this. You don't have to worry about namespacing anymore. 
you just say, in this file, I have a root, I have a tile, title, that should be image, message, and then what it's auto-generated for you, because this is the source, is something that looks like this. So it'll be automatically generated from your component and all, all, so that there's no collisions and you don't have to worry about um, prefixing or doing anything fancy. Uh, and then the last one I wanted to show is kind of this movement to uh, away from writing CSS directly um, or CSS files and having to deal with um, what is it, specificity wars and the actual cascading nature of CSS and let's just style this component directly and not have anything bleed outside of the component. So the, the simplest way to accomplish that is just by doing inline styles. So you will have um, um, a styles file that you'll import um, that will just have the individual styles. So here you use the style um, attribute or style prop instead of the the class name prop, and the style prop is just an object, so you just pass in um, the styles that way, and your thing that you're importing would look something like this. So the downside is that you're no longer writing CSS, right? You're not gonna get kind of the browser's auto-completion, you have to write it in the um, JavaScript format, so you have to do camel case instead of the other way. So it's not as as great, not as, um, as nice, and with, just inline styles, you can't do any pseudo selectors, media queries, that sort of thing. Um, but there are other libraries that are now coming out to make that easier. Um, so one of them is Glamorous that you should check out um, that I've just been um, looking at and we're considering using that for Eventbrite. So it's kind of like the best of both worlds, being able to do uh, CSS in JavaScript, but still be able to write CSS kind of normally. So check out Glamorous, Radium is another one that helps you do it, um, and then I have links to CSS modules, um, Bootstrap, Material UI, Foundation, they all have component libraries as well that you can use for that. Okay, and then last one I want to talk about was um, single page apps. If you're trying to build a single page app, you, um, you want to actually be able to go from one screen to another screen fetch data, that sort of thing. So how would you do that? First, you would use the fetch API that's on the browsers now. So maybe most of you are familiar with it, I'm not sure, but window.fetch in the browser now replaces jQuery or dollar sign Ajax, basically. So it's a promise-based uh, interface. Here I'm making a get call to my website here, and then I get the data back, and then I can do something if it succeeds, if it fails, um, that way, and you can actually mix this with um, async functions to make it a little even easier to use, but the Fetch API comes with all modern browsers and GitHub released uh, a polyfill so that you can actually use it for the browsers that don't support it as well. And here are some links there um, that you can use uh, to understand what's going on with Fetch. And then routing is what you're also going to need if you want to be able to uh, say bookmarks or uh, be able to have back button support, that sort of thing. You're going to want to be able to route on the client. And I, I struggled really hard to find another competitor besides a React router. I don't even know what Aviator is. It was, just, <laughs> it was like the one that had the most recent commit that uh, was useful because most of them were like two, three years old. Uh, really, React router is the one you use. It's now on version four. Um, it, it's now having a, a very uh, nice uh, interface that they're, that they're creating with React Router. So you get to use the same kind of JSX that you're familiar with um, in your code. So you just declare your router here. In this case, it's a browser router because I'm in the browser. But the nice thing about React Router now is that it works in um, React Native and kind of all other uh, environments that React works as well, familiar. Um, syntax that you can use. So I'm using React Router DOM. Here I'm defining some kind of like global header navigation simple thing um, using links uh, component, um, which will be imported from here if I wrote the code correctly, um, which is just an A tag basically. And then you declare your routes and what you want them to do and they'll go to different components. So that's kind of like the simplest, simplest example of how to use React Router but it has lots of different configurations for that. 
So now we're at the asteroid belt. That's kind of like the halfway point in this. Um, so like I said, I'd be running out of time, so I couldn't go through all of it. But uh, the next thing we'll be talking about testing, um, and especially using Jest, which now comes with Create React Cap, um, which will be um, which is really helpful with snapshot testing. There's also performance and SEO. So this is all about rendering server side, because when you render server side, the client doesn't have to uh, create the, the app itself. It's actually coming in, so it's a little bit faster that way. And you get uh, SEO boost and uh, open graph tags if you need that sort of support. You would want to render server side. And Google uh, gives you a little bump if your site renders quickly. So rendering server side helps with that. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to call it Uranus. Um, <laughs> uh, talking about app data management. And this is where Redux comes in. This is where the flux architectures come in. So I'm, I'm mentioning this way at the end. This is when I think uh, you need to know about uh, Redux after you've kind of tackled all these other things. Um, so there are a number of different flux architectures, but Redux is the one that's kind of um, taken the cake and what everyone uses. And then uh, lastly, API optimization uh, is about GraphQL and Relay and Falcor, those kind of uh, different things. So that's now moving away from the client and talking about how do we make optimized queries um, to the server. So no longer making REST APIs, but what if I just asked for exactly what I want and I got all that back as a JSON object? What would that, what would that look like? So that was the, the quick review with the last ones and, and what we talked about there. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the libraries that we use now, Facebook actually creates themselves. So they created Yarn and Flow and Jest. And uh, I mean, technically, they didn't create Redux. We just hired the guy who did and sucked it in. But you know, <laughs> they still did it and Relay and, and what have you. Uh, so Facebook is both a social network and an open source company, I guess, at the same time. So just uh, to finish off, I'd like to give some shout outs and thanks. I want to thank Modern Web, Tracy, especially for uh, having me here and for setting all of this up, as well as the South Bay uh, JS as well, and Shape Security for having us here and providing the pizza. Uh, I'm no longer angry because they had the pizza, so shout out to all of them. I want to thank Eventbrite as well uh, for providing an atmosphere where we are kind of um, learning with new tools and allowing us to use new technology um, um, as well and um, being kind of supportive of, of that with us. And then lastly, thank you to all of you for being attentive and listening and like not walking out and, and things like that. So really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you. So the question was about React Fiber. Um, I'm actually uh, going to be giving a talk at React uh, Rally about Fiber and uh, what it's coming with. So React Fiber is just basically a new re complete rewrite of the reconciler of React. So kind of what we think of the virtual DOM. Um, it's a rewrite and how that um, could help with making our React apps run faster and prioritize different um, pieces of it. So I haven't actually used it in any of my um, applications yet, um, but there are a lot of kind of positives that come out with, uh, with using it. So it doesn't necessarily change how we write our React applications, but in certain cases, some things that we do, especially animations, can perform a lot better with it. Question. Okay. Yeah. So create the the big push with create React app is that you didn't have to do any kind of configuration. It just came out of the box. So right now, create React app does not have CSS modules, but there's talk about it having it and them adding it in there. So. I believe I saw a tweet from Dan Abramel asking if people would actually be interested in CSS modules being a part of it. So as I 
as I believe, it's not there now, but there's a plan potentially to add it in there. Um, but even after you use Create React App, you can still import and install lots of other modules that you need as well. Okay.